call this natalie peptide system <coughs> that's the disclosure for the talk today um, so one of the underappreciated so to speak function of the heart is that heart is an endocrine organ uh, it secretes hormones and this is a schematic describing using ANP as a model hormone. So if we have wall stress, uh, we, um, we know that we release nitrate peptides. They, they go into secretion and they have a plethora of biological effects on kidneys, blood vessels, brings about nat diuresis, natriuresis, vasodilatation. I think a key distinction and um, that I like to make up front is this is a system that is causal in the development of disease and is reflected as a consequence of disease as well. So as a clinical cardiology community, we are focused on the consequence of the disease. So when you have acute decompensated heart failure, you spill natriuretic peptides into the circulation and the response arm of the NP axis as shown there is responsible for that spill and um, um, it's widely recognized as a biomarker. Uh, what we are focused essentially is when the system is causal in the development of the disease. As Dr. Wang elegantly put this morning, um, it really depends uh, when you're trying to answer the chicken or the egg question is where in the disease process you are. So NP deficiency as a cause of cardiometabolic disease, um, you know, there is plethora of animal data, there are a lot of good animal papers uh, out there where receptor knockout mice uh, was uh, shown to have high blood pressure, weight gain, insulin resistance, leading to hypertension, diabetes, and kidney disease. The human genetic data really come from Dr. Wang's efforts uh, where, um, you know, in a, in a sort of candidate gene study, but involved 30,000 people, a uh, major allele of RS5468. Common variants uh, associated with natriuretic peptide levels were reported. One of the common variants is um, RS5468. The allele frequency is 5%. Um, so major allele of this RS5468 was associated with lower NP levels. Uh, roughly 20% decreased circulating NP levels, uh, leading to 15% increased risk of hypertension. <coughs> when I think about um, you know, types of studies that you will read about natriuretic peptides. You will often read um, FE studies where natriuretic peptides are reported, higher levels are bad because higher levels tell you more people are going to die. So genetics is really one way to think about when people, when there, are, when there is no sort of reverse confounding. Uh, you know, people who are born um, uh, with lower NP levels have increased risk of disease. So it travels one way, you know, you, you start with your DNA and you develop the disease. Uh, so this is one of the cleanest uh, sort of model confirming a natriuretic peptide deficiency, a key concept that Dr. Wang put forward. Um, we took this forward a little bit. Um, um, then, you know, essentially this, when, when this paper was designed um, and I was a postdoc fellow in Dr. Wang's lab, uh, I used to think this was at least 10 years ahead, if not uh, the study design. So uh, the study design that he put forward was, what is really the relative effect of RS5468 on ENP levels? The reason this is important is uh, because in large scale population genetic studies, um, you know, you have various <laughs> confounding people are on different diets, uh, they are on different medications, they're adjusted, you, you get to know that okay, if you have a minor allele of this uh, SNP, you are 20% decreased uh, in, a, uh, in NP levels, but what is this effect and how can one study it? So I think it was fascinating that uh, the study design uh, proposed back then and not up until now, five years and counting, not many genotype directed physiologic studies have been done, uh, which is sort of a unique way to get to function, um, in a sense, physiological function uh, uh, coming out from the, uh, from the GVA studies. So genotype-directed physiologic study was proposed. Um, the idea was to select people, recruit people based on genotype and manipulate their environment. Um, what we did here was we genotyped for uh, this particular variant, 700 people were genotyped, all Caucasians, healthy, normotensive, so healthy humans, so healthy humans are uh, perfect. Uh, to be studied as um, a human model, um, no confounding by any disease, um, done only in Caucasians because the original uh, discovery by Dr. Wang and his colleagues was 
in Caucasian population. 4% minor allele frequency, we recruited 23 people with low ANP or AA genotype and uh, 8 people with high ANP or AG genotype. Um, it took me two years to find these people, um, uh, not that common um, and once you find them, not everyone wants to undergo an intensive dietary investigation. So the uh, design of the study was high sodium diet for one week, um, low sodium diet for one week in random order. This is what the food looked like. L lot of complaints about the food on the right, uh, right panel, uh, uh, not so much complaints about the food on the left. Uh, GCRC overnight stay was done, 2 liter saline infusion uh, for 2 hours, uh, serial anti pro ANP measurements uh, and these were the results from the study. So plasma anti pro ANP levels on y axis and if you look at uh, the relative differences, uh, you see the genotype difference which is roughly 50% is same as uh, when you transition people from a low salt to high salt rate. So essentially your genotype effect is similar to taking a high salt diet for one week. <coughs> And this was sort of first quantification of a genetic variant and uh, effect of the genetic variant physiologically. And then we uh, move forward and we gave them 2 liter saline infusion and we realized that uh, AG individuals, so they start um, uh, higher and they stay higher. So they have increased ANP set point without altering really the responsiveness to salt loading. This was all good. Um, uh, and then we started scratching, um, you know, how is this happening, um, what is the, uh, you know, so sort of from association, from genetic association to causation. Uh, so for some trainees in the audiences, uh, if you are working on follow-up of genetic variants, uh, this is how you can think about a gene. Uh, so you have a, your exon intron, intergenic region, your 5 prime UTR, coding region 3 prime UTR. 88% of the GVA SNPs are intergenic or intronic um, and what can you do uh, when you have an intergenic or an intronic hit from a GVAS? You have uh, publicly available tools and these have changed. Uh, MIT um, has new tools um, that don't appear on this slide uh, set but you can get a lot of information before you design your experiment, before you design your functional experiment by just looking what is out there and I'll show you an example of how we did this in one of the studies. Um, you have coding region SNPs. Um, this was my first sort of um, postdoc um, work in Framingham uh, where I went after coding, uh, where, you know, literally coding each coding region SNP using polypen and SIFT. Uh, it gives you a score and it tells you whether the mutation is damaging, possibly damaging or whatnot. And then you can have a 3 prime UTR SNP. Um, so, uh, their microRNAs and you know interference with microRNA binding is now well known. Um, back at that time, um, you know, really, you know, central dogma of molecular biology is it, uh, information flows from DNA, RNA to protein. I think uh, what changed uh, this and led to the discovery of microRNAs are uh, these small single-stranded RNA molecules. They can reduce the protein level by affecting mRNA stability or suppressing translation. Uh, this is a uh, schematic from one of the review articles. Uh, the seed portion of the microRNA is important while, when it interacts with, your, uh, with the gene of interest. So how did we think about it? In, in our case, um, 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 I, I mean probably it was a stroke of luck. Um, the, the SNP that we were chasing was in 3' prime UTR. So we thought about microRNAs. Uh, we thought about are there microRNAs that bind to 3' prime UTR? Uh, and regulate mRNA stability and does, uh, is there a microRNA that interferes with this binding? Uh, and if so, is the microRNA present in circulation and in, 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 in study subjects? Um, so, uh, we, we took some bioinformatic help. Now these tools are very well developed. They are developed on a much larger scale than they were five years ago. Um, at that time, um, we recognized that there were three microRNAs that would bind to the three prime UTR of the ANP or uh, the NPPA gene um, listed here um, and uh, the binding site um, is highlighted, the RS5468 is highlighted in red. Next thing, the f next logical thing to do was to check whether they are expressed in cardiac tissue. So we had one of them not expressed in the cardiac tissue and two of them were expressed. Uh, further work is focused on uh, microRNA 425 because 4770 did not pan out in the in vitro experiments. 
how did we design the in vitro experiment um, for this audience? Uh, this is probably subcortical. Uh, you guys are all familiar with uh, uh, luciferase reporter assays, uh, control co construct, you insert your UTR uh, into the plasmid. So you have a three prime UTR major allele plasmid, essentially AA plasmid. And then you make a single base pair change and you have a plasmid which is an AG plasmid. So once you have those two plasmids, you have your control plasmid, uh, you are uh, looking at transient transfection with either 425 or anti 425 and you are measuring luciferase activity as your readout. Um, <coughs> the, the schematic on the top left uh, tells you what we anticipated. So what we anticipated was uh, uh, for a plasmid that had uh, the AA allele, uh, the microRNA 425 would bind, would suppress uh, uh, the luciferase activity and for minor allele there will be no binding. And what we see here in the bottom panel is um, a major Luke plasmid or the AA plasmid uh, had binding, uh, relative luciferase activity was suppressed 50%, minor Luke had no change. You could think that um, this experiment was done in cost 7 cells, you could think anti 425 would uh, reverse the NPPA 3 prime UTR inhibition of endogenous microRNA 425. So, um, you know, in the presence of anti 425, microRNA 425 would not bind and you will see the reversal of inhibition as you see on the bottom figure below uh, with minor leuk as no change. Uh, we did something uh, creative um, um, and instead of modifying um, the binding on the gene side, we modified it on the mere side. So we custom created a microRNA where we changed so that it would match to the uh, G, uh, AG or the minor allele plasmid and not the AA plasmid. Um, so here as anticipated, uh, you see binding in the minor leuk and not in the major leuk. So this was all uh, good in vitro experimental data. Um, when I showed it to my mentor, he initially did not believe it. So he told me to do it three times. Don't come back to him until I have shown this three times. Um, and I still uh, live by that. So something if um, you, know, you, are, you weren't expecting um, or you run into a result um, in science, it's uh, always good practice to confirm before you, um, you, know, you go out in this wild run of reporting results. Um, so uh, what we did here was these are human, cardi uh, IPS uh, derived human cardiomyocytes. This is um, um, after Satu stock, uh, this was the best we got back then. This was the best uh, some people use still now. Um, you know, um, unfortunately in, um, in cardiology, human heart is not that easily available. Um, so we showed in uh, IPS cells 50% degrees in the mRNA levels and 50 to 60% degrees in the protein levels. Uh, we're all very excited about it. Uh, everything um, translated the way we thought it would. Um, and then we went after looking um, whether we could detect the microRNA in the circulation. Essentially, um, you know, uh, natriuretic peptides, as I said, they're very good biomarkers. And, um, you know, we wanted to see the regulator is, um, if it is, a, if it is uh, present in the circulation, does it, or does it, or can it serve as a biomarker? Um, we did see um, effect of uh, the, um, the effect of the dietary sodium, the dietary salt that we did in the AA genotype, we see um, uh, meal levels going down. So the uh, microRNA levels that are detected in circulation uh, are responsive to dietary sodium, not so much in the AG genotype. And uh, putting this all together uh, from association to causation, uh, microRNA 425 is present in human heart. It's present in the plasma. It modulates NPPA gene expression. Minor G allele of RS5468 alters binding site for microRNA 425 and uh, confers resistance to down regulation by MIR 425. How can you put it uh, in perspective in a 30,000 feet view? Uh, so you start with population genetic studies that Dr. Wang did. Uh, initially, you come up uh, with genetic variants uh, in large scale population data sets. Uh, these could be associated with whatever phenotype you are interested in. In our case, the phenotype was uh, what we like to think an intermediate phenotype, which was natriuretic peptide levels rather than a disease. Uh, you take that genetic information and you want to design a functional uh, study um, to understand both physiology. So, uh, you know, one of um, 
we have been in too many conferences where people have criticized uh, GVASs. Uh, one of the strength of GVASs is it has led uh, many of us to realize a lot of physiology that was underappreciated before. Whether or not it translates into therapeutics is a different question, but we have started realizing human physiology uh, more and more um, thinking about these genetic variants. Um, you can come up with a molecular mechanism. In this case, it was interference of binding by microRNA 425. And uh, theoretically, it is possible. And in some cases, uh, there are antimers out there that uh, are in phase two trials um, uh, for, uh, for treatment. Um, we haven't pursued uh, this limb yet further, um, um, uh, therapeutics based on antimere 425. Um, I'm going to change completely from genetics as deficiency and if, um, if, um, if you remember from Dr. Wang's talk this morning, other than genetics, obesity um, is also a natural peptide deficiency state, a well-known de natural peptide deficiency state. So uh, there was a human protocol that we wanted to do to address this. And um, you know, again, uh, the study was designed um, to see whether weight gain or waste, weight loss could uh, directly lead to changes in natural peptide levels. This work was published uh, in 2015. Uh, I think I was at UAB back then. Um, so. Study design uh, was a B subject screen for gastric bypass surgery at the MGH waste center. They had no kidney or heart disease. They were pre-gastric bypass, uh, saline infusion, blood sampling, and echocardiograms were done. Six months later, we had these people come back. Uh, Post-gastric surgery CRC visit, uh, similar protocol was followed. Uh, this is a baseline characteristics table, uh, pre and post. Uh, the strength of this study or strength of these uh, human studies, uh, especially in this case, each person is serving their own control. Um, so we were able to capture people pre and post bypass, um, not something uh, very easy to do in this patient population. Um, the echo parameters for this audience, I'll just skip. We had improvement in the relaxation um, after surgery. So this is what I wanted to uh, show. I think this came up as a question this morning. At least from this work, we had some information. You can see all four NPs, uh, both mature peptides and, and terminal pro, uh, pro peptides, all of them, they went up after bypass surgery. So your top um, panel is your po post bypass and your bottom uh, line is your pre bypass. Um, this tells us uh, really to, really an important thing is higher set point of natriuretic peptide after the weight loss, reversal of natriuretic peptide handicap, so to speak, in obese population could explain resolution of high risk metabolic phenotypes seen in post gastric bypass surgery patients. But more importantly, um, pro ANP and pro BNP does not bind to the clearance receptor. Uh, I mean, this at least alludes um, uh, to the fact that there could be impaired synthesis or secretion, uh, which is a cause of handicap in obese subjects, and uh, rather than just the clearance being um, uh, the issue. We're going to talk about uh, how acute metabolic challenge, so this is obesity, you can um, think about uh, chronically, um, you know, it's a chronic disease and chronically um, um, this state happens, but what happens in acute metabolic challenge? So acutely, if you affect your environment, can it affect your natural peptide levels? This work was um, um, done um, under Dr. Wang's mentorship. Um, the idea here was to assess the acute effects of carbohydrate challenge on natural peptide levels in healthy subjects to determine if there was a difference between change in NPs and lean versus overweight and obese individuals and to investigate potential mechanisms linking hyperglycemia and reduced natriuretic peptide response. So study design uh, was similar to our uh, previous physiologic study that I um, presented, healthy normodensive volunteers, again healthy and normodensive being the key um, so that there is no confounding on natriuretic peptide levels by any of the disease status. Lean individuals were uh, lean and overweight individuals were recruited, they came after overnight fasting. Um, and metabolic challenge was given with a high carbohydrate shake. Uh, serial measurements were done. Um, these are the glucose and insulin results. So you see obese individuals being hyperinsulinemic uh, as opposed to the uh, lean. Um, and you see on the left panel, pro ANP drops almost 30% uh, um, um, after glucose challenge and no change in pro BNP levels. What this led us to believe was 
carbohydrate challenge selectively reduced uh, pro NP but not uh, pro BNP and this human data we did not move forward uh, with publishing it uh, because we weren't sure what's going on why is it peptide selective and uh, really what's the mechanism of just uh, pro ANP um, uh, getting suppressed after metabolic challenge uh, come to think of it uh, um, you know we went after uh, the negative regulator that we previously uh, uh, published um, uh, micro RNA 425 that does glucose treatment increase uh, pri and mature mere 425 and if it's so does it decrease NPPA mRNA levels in human karyomyocytes. So as you can see in the slide uh, deck here from left to right uh, both primary and mature mere levels are increased after glucose treatment of human karyomyocytes and uh, NPPA levels are decreased and uh, one, one would think um, you know uh, is this enough? Um, probably not. Um, so we took this little bit forward um, and this is where I was initially alluding to you can learn a lot about gene uh, by just looking up what is out there. So if you look at ENCODE chip seek track and you look at this figure this is just a snapshot from the UCSC genomic browser. What, what really is happening is you have your microRNA 425 gene you are looking at the promoter region. Um, and you're looking at the transcription factor. So uh, one of the transcription factors that is known to be stimulated by glucose is NF-kappa B. So you see NF-kappa B binding sites in the promoter region of microRNA 425. You know, by this time I was, um, I had learned um, really that it's about not turning the gene off, uh, not turning the gene on, but you're turning the gene off um, because previous work was focused on microRNA 425. Now we went back to the promoter region, turning the gene on and how are those transcription factors important. So sort of a distinction to make, um, we, we thought that glucose is stimulating NF-kappa B and this work was done in um, collaboration with um, uh, Dr. Hamid and Dr. Prabhu. Um, we thought that um, NF-kappa B is um, getting stimulated by glucose, so overexpression of NF-kappa B, P50 and P65 subunits, um, the plasmids, uh, we see the microRNA level increases um, and when you have an NF-kappa B inhibitor SN50, um, the glucose mediated increase in the primary levels is abrogated in the presence of NF-kappa B inhibitor. Um, we further went on to create a transgenic mice. Um, the, the binding of microRNAs uh, are species specific. So mice and human they are different in UTR. UTR is 300 base pair. Mice and human they are different in UTR by two bases um, and uh, believe it or not those two bases regulate how um, the interaction between near 425 and NPPA happens. Uh, so what we did was we ordered a bag, we took out um, a 12 KB region, uh, purified it, um, uh, that fragment and you guys are familiar how transgenic mice, uh, mice are developed. Uh, so we had a humanized mice, humanized ANP mice uh, and we did um, do the same experiment. So oral gastric lavage or administration of glucose in the mice uh, causes increased cardiac mere levels and um, uh, decreases the ANP levels. Uh, that data is not shown here. How do you put all of this together? Um, so you have your glucose, um, a carbohydrate intake. Um, um, that acute metabolic influence uh, is stimulating your uh, NFKPA B transcription factors. They bind to the promoter of the microRNA 425 gene, um, turns on the transcription of the gene, uh, microRNA 425 binds to the ANP um, and causes decreased ANP production. So this was uh, explained as one of the model of um, a possible mechanism of how high car carbohydrate challenge is causing the suppression of ANP. And um, um, I'm sure all of you are convinced after this morning's keynote lecture that decreased nitrate peptides, which are causal for the development of disease, have adverse short term and long term consequences. Um, so, we moved our focus to race as a nitrate peptide deficiency. Um, this is also um, um, after chatting with Dr. Wang, um, uh, he shared his initial observations in population cohorts, and we did some work here. Uh, we are fortunate at UAP to have uh, public health population based cohorts easily available um, to us to look at um, uh, some of these things. 
So what is shown here in, a, in the bottom figure, uh, in the top table, the bottom, uh, the third row, 27% uh, lower white um, natatory peptide levels than your whites uh, in African Americans. And then we did a, uh, you know, we, we did report a pooled analysis, uh, pooling the data with Dr. Wang's initial publications uh, from Dallas and Eric, uh, and um, showed in thousands of people now, like 35% lower natatory peptide levels. Um, uh, how does this, how are we going to take race as a work forward uh, is something I've been, we've been scratching now our brains in lab. Um, so epi studies are very good. They give you initial observations. Um, there are, um, you, I, I mean, um, for this audience, you can read that in the third row, there are 15 factors. You can add five more factors and you can have, have, have X amount of covariates. Uh, but at 60 year old, you can never sort of get rid of residual confounding that exists when you report uh, observations. So when humans are 60 year old, um, they don't, they are not like mice and it's not easy um, uh, to get rid of uh, residual confounding. Uh, so one way to do this is to take this into young people, recruit young people, hopefully some of the residual confounding is, uh, uh, will not be there and hopefully we'll be able to find whether uh, natatory peptide levels are really low, are they, because if in young adults and really like 20 year old kids, if these levels are low, then, you know, then that tells you something about this hormone system being suppressed uh, uh, by race. Um, and the other key question is, um, these are baseline levels and um, um, I'm sure some of you will hit the gym tonight after eating lunch here. Um, um, then uh, what happens to your levels when, when you stress the system? So what happens with physiological perturbations such as exercise or glucose challenge. So we designed two clinical trials. These are ongoing clinical trials. Uh, the picture that you see up there um, is Dr. Patel. He's an extremely hardworking um, uh, T32 fellow with us. Uh, he's working on these two trials. Um, Nirav is um, uh, going to present the results of the first trial in the Featherhill Young Investigator Award um, uh, later today or tomorrow. Um, and then he's presenting in the American Heart Association Young Investigator Report for Genomic and Precision Medicine Council. The first trial was designed essentially to show, um, to know, uh, we know that uh, glucose challenge is going to suppress. Now we want to know whether system is responding differently in blacks and whites, so is the slope different. The second trial is an ongoing trial. Um, uh, it involves two kinds of perturbations, exercise and uh, beta blocker, both designed to increase natatory peptide release. So um, uh, the focus is on young adults. The focus is on uh, not on baseline levels, uh, now on perturbations uh, to see. Um, we are also doing some work. I'm not going to show that data today um, in collaboration with uh, Kiran Musunuru at UPenn to see genomically if we, can, if we know whether expression is a problem of these racial differences or um, uh, processing. This is my basic science mentor. I lost him uh, during the course of this journey. Um, uh, when I, I, and I must say when I started, I, when, I, when I went to the bench lab, I, from, I went from a genetic association lab in MIT to the bench lab. Um, I did not know how to pipette. He took me on a Sunday and um, we made LB together and you know, um, his, his words stuck my brain. Um, uh, when things won't work in the lab, he would tell me go back to um, where you had them working right. So you'll always find your shoes where you last left them. Uh, with that, I want to thank, um, um, uh, and this, these are my mentors, um, Dr. Wang, Dr. Newton Che, Dr. Prabhu, um, clinical research team, Dr. Patel uh, in particular.